So now the interpretation of the electrical potential energy function. So the first thing, so if you were in my physics 4A class, you probably know where I'm going to go, go with this. It's that only differences in energy have any meaning. So what I'm saying here is that if you write the potential energy of a single point, that's meaningless. In other words, if you write that this is the potential energy like this, this is absolutely meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. It means nothing. The problem is, is that we get lazy and we just say potential. What's physical is the change in potential. And so when I look at the change in potential, it's really the difference in these two terms right here. This right here is meaningful. And the reason why it's meaningful is that the way you define potential energy is by doing work. Meaningless here says that you, you can't do work at a single point. That's impossible. Here, this implies that work was done. So you have two locations that you're actually moving. That's why the difference in potential energy is meaningful, not just the potential energy of a point. But again, we get sloppy in our language. So now, drawing a picture such as a bar diagram shows these differences. And the key thing is that work, excuse me, when work is done, it does not disappear, but reappears as stored work which that is the definition of energy here. So my bar diagram, it's going to look like this. So let's draw two of them to show you what I mean by that. So if I have a potential, let me bring this down here. So I'm going to have a potential energy here. And then this right here is also the exact same energy state. So when I look at this thing here, if no work is done, then it stays just like this. But now if I do external work, and this is the amount of work that I do, then from here to here is then the change in potential energy. 
So when I'm looking at this, as I've said before, the work does not disappear. Right, right here we say that it reappears as the change in potential energy. So what do we say here? That this term is meaningless and that is meaningless. Work is meaningful as well as the change is meaningful. So one thing that I forgot to do here is that this guy is in the total potential energy of that. Now to show you why this is meaningless, if I look at just one point, what if I start with this amount of potential energy? And so now I have a different initial energy state. But if I do the same work, I then get this situation here. And what we find here is that when I look at this, this work that did this now has the same change in energy. So it turns out that these two states are meaningless. In fact, they're, they're arbitrary. But this here, as it, as it reappears here, these two guys are the only thing that's meaningful and the only thing that you can measure. That's why a single point means nothing. Only the change. That's the only thing we can do. Now, let's go to the next one. So here I'm going to rely on your mechanics course to remember this. So from your mechanics course, and what I mean is sort of like physics 4A, physics 7A, whatever that you're doing, the gravitational potential energy, which I typically write as GPE, is defined relative to a reference potential. One chooses the reference to be zero. In other words, we want the reference potential to be zero. And what that does here is that that typically means here is that we assign our reference to be zero, but it's arbitrary. So one has the ability, because we can only measure changes, one has the ability to arbitrarily choose the ground. So if I look at this thing here, you could imagine that I have, or I'm going to drop a ball. And so let's say that this is a little platform right here. So we're going to drop a ball onto this platform. So if I look at this, it's going to fall right into here. Since we can only talk about 
um, differences, the only thing we care about is we only care about one value, is this height change. This height change is what's important. So this guy is the actual height change. So I could choose any reference to make sure that I get that height change. So what we typically do here is that we can choose multiple references. So then if I look at these multiple references, I could say here, like let's say in one here, I'm going to call this guy here my y1 equal to 0. And then I can choose my y2 right here. And all we care about is by choosing that reference there, then I measure this guy to be delta y. So in this case, this choice here is the most convenient. But we don't have to choose that for convenience. We can also come in and we can choose a different one. What if I chose one here instead? Where in this case, I'll call this y, I don't know if I call that one and two, I'll call this three equals to zero. And then this guy here is equal to y4. This is totally legit because now we can see here is that then this distance from here to here is going to be y4. And then this distance from here to here is going to be, ooh, y3 prime, and so when I subtract these two, I'm going to get a difference from here to here that gives me the same height change. Only differences matter. So what I'm going to assume here is that you're going to remember that when we go to calculate any potential function, the potential function between um, 2 and 1 is exactly the same as the potential function between 4 and 3. They're exactly the same because they depend on that height change delta y, and we're measuring it the same. So what happens in electrical cases? The reference electrical potential energy is no different where one picks the, the uh, reference such that the electrical potential energy at R equal to R reference is set to zero. And you can see that there's only really one place. So if I look at the change in the potential energy, that's going to be U of R minus U of R reference, which then reads 4 pi epsilon Q, big Q, and then I'm going to get a term of 1 over R minus 1 over R reference. So if we want this term to be 0 here, we then choose R, R reference to be at infinity. And so when we do that, then the potential energy function then reads 4 pi epsilon r over little q, big Q, minus 0. Now, it might seem silly here, but this is important. Because it talks about the potential between two points, not one. So... If you're just writing this term, the front term by itself, then it looks like you're talking about a point which is physically meaningless. Now, 
For points and spheres, setting our reference to infinity is by far the best choice. But if you did that for the electrical cylinder, you'd find that you'd be you'd have an electric field of infinity. So that's a bad choice. And we'll get there later on in this chapter. So now, let's go to what we've talked about before here. Let's see. I want to understand what is the physical meaning of the electrical potential energy. And it goes by two words. The electrical potential energy, a lot of the time, goes by binding energy or ionization energy. So we need to understand those before we could sort of like move on here. So I believe this is the third one right here. So now, what is the physical meaning of the electrical potential energy. The name for electrical potential energy has multiple names. I'm going to just tell you the most common one. So the electrical potential energy is also known as the binding energy. And sometimes you'll see me write BE. And then there's this thing called the ionization. Ionization energy. And, of course, this is equal to the change in the electrical potential energy. They all mean the same thing. It's just the wording that we have to pay attention to. So now, let's see what we can do with this. So I'm going to give you an example. And this is a fairly detailed example. And in this example... I want to talk about the hydrogen atom. So here, this is my example to explain what this means. A hydrogen atom is composed of a bound proton electron pair to create a hydrogen atom the electric field of the proton must do work. It must do work to bring the electron from R1 equal to infinity to R2, which is, I'm just going to call R here, and this is what they... So this would be 0 0.05 nanometers, and this is what's typically called the bond length. Not the bound length, it should be the bond length. So it must do work to bring the electron from rest, from infinity, to that bond length to bind the electron in the protons 
well. So let's try to let's draw a picture for this. So picture wise, I'm going to draw two pictures. I'm going to draw sort of like the physical picture. Okay, so picture wise, there's the so called physical picture. And what we're seeing here is that I imagine that I have a proton. So this is my proton right here. And it has a positive charge. And I'm going to say that I'm going to call that Q. So what we know here is that it has an electric field that points outwards. So now I have my electron. So what am I doing with my electron? My electron is here, and then I'm going to move it all the way over to here. In other words, I'm at a location of R1 equals to infinity, and I'm gonna say that the charge of this electron is Q, and then what I'm seeing here is that there are two forces, there's a force here, there's the electric force that's in this direction. And of course, there is a displacement in that direction. And so I'm going to move this electron all the way to R2, where I said that this was the location where you most likely are going to find a proton. So now, the question that I think is a much better picture is the potential energy picture. So when I look at the potential energy picture, what do we draw here? Well, the proton has a potential energy function. So if I look at this thing, I'm going to draw this. So let's say that this is my potential energy. And I know here that I have a potential energy of the proton, which is acting like a point particle. And it has to be given by this expression right here. So if I'm looking, if I plot one over R, it's now looking like this. Now note that this should be a three-dimensional picture, but I'm not going to draw it. Oops. So this, all of this is again the forbidden region. So now I look at my electron. So my electron now is starting right here. And this electron is then going to be, work is going to be done on it, and it's going to be brought to this location right here. So what are these two locations? This is R1 equal to infinity. And then this location right here, this is then going to be R2, which is, of course, 0 0.05 nanometers. So it is now, I have to do work now. So now the electric field is going to do what? It's going to do work. And as it does work, it's going to move this charge towards the thing here. So this is a much more physical picture. So if you have this, then the potential energy function is then going to be the the proton, and this is, of course, that of a point charge. So then I'm going to get 4 pi epsilon, and I'm going to get Q, big Q, and then I'm going to have 1 over R minus 1 over the reference potential. So what you're seeing here is that this guy is moving down. That potential has to be negative, not positive. 
So if I look at this, then I can rewrite this guy in this situation, and I'm going to have, again, a negative value, and I'm going to get 4 pi epsilon r little q, big Q, and then I'm going to get a term here of minus zero. Now, to just say why this has to be the case here, this negative is important because that negative tells us here is that the negative value implies the electron is bound inside the proton's potential well. Now, I want to take this with me because I don't want to redraw this again. And so what I'm going to do is that I want to now put some 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 information on here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to get rid of these values here. And I'm going to get rid of this function here because we already know that it's there. And I don't care about this here. So now what's happening is that what you're seeing here is that what do we mean by the potential energy? The potential energy is the depth of this well right here. So I look at this thing, and this guy is how much energy, and that is the electrical potential energy right there. And at this point up here, this is the electrical potential energy of zero. So if this is zero, note that this is a negative value. So this means here is that this charge is going from a high to a low potential energy. So what's important about this is that that guy right there, this is the binding energy. This is due to the work done by the electric field to bring the electron from R1 equals to infinity to R2. That's what we mean by the binding energy. So when I make the statement that the electrical potential energy or the change in electrical potential energy is the binding energy, that's what I mean. This is exactly what I'm talking about. It's one and the same. That's the energy that binds that electron. And, and another thing that I should say here is that this distance right here, I don't know if I've said this already or not, this guy right here, this is the bond length. So now let's see if we could finish this discussion right here. And it goes like this. On the other hand, if one wants to remove 
the electron from the potential energy well one has to overcome the binding energy delta u e that is work is required to remove this electron and the language then says that the work required to remove then has the language of ionization energy. But wait a minute, that ionization energy is the exactly the same as the potential energy here. So let me uh, come up here and copy this guy and then modify it. So now I am trying to remove the electron. So then I'm going to get rid of all of this here because we don't we don't care about this anymore. So in other words, we're trying to get the electron to move from low energy to high energy. Oops, didn't want to erase that. Right, we're trying to get it to go from low energy to high energy, and as a consequence, I have to do work. And this work is what's called the ionization energy. And so I have to do that much to at least get that all the way to a potential energy of zero. Five, our last point. Electrical potential energy depends both on position and charge. So if I look at the, the potential energy of a point, what that means here is that I have my potential energy at R and then I have my potential energy at my reference. So when I write this, the way I'm going to almost always interpret potential energy is that I do this. I start at infinity. And then I arrive at R. So now the question is, let's physically explain delta U of E by thinking how much work is required. Okay, how much work is required? So here we go, distance, dependence. So I have two charges. On this side, I'm going to have my test charge, Q. So I'm going to imagine that I have a charge like this. In each of these situations, 
And each of these charges start off at r equal to infinity. So in each of these situations, these guys are at infinity. I have a source charge, which is right here. So this guy here is my source charge, which I'm going to call big Q. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's an insulator or a, a, a conductor. It does not matter. The same argument works. Now, I'm going to take this charge. And what am I going to do? I'm going to move this charge really close to the electric field. Excuse me, to the source charge. And then this one, I'm only going to move a distance that's that's definitely farther. So what we're seeing here is that the charge starts at infinity. And this is what we mean by Q. And it's going to go all the way until it gets to this distance right here, which we're going to call little r. This one is much farther, so therefore it has a larger R. So then I ask the question, how, which one requires more work? Right? The question's the same. Which requires more work? So this guy, I'm bringing this to really close. So I'm at a much smaller distance from the source. And what's happening here is that at this point, we can see here is that the electric field right here has to be enormous. So I got to work harder. So because this is a smaller distance to the source, that tells me I had to do more work. And because I did more work, that means I have more stored energy. Therefore, I have a higher electrical potential energy. So in this case, we then write it like this. So you know what? I'm going to draw this in red. So then the language then says this, that uh, the reason why I have such a large electrical potential energy is because I did a lot of work to bring this guy from infinity and I brought it to a very close distance in the denominator. On the other hand, if I look at the second one, the electric field is much smaller here. And because it's smaller, I don't have to do that much more work to get it to there. So then this situation, I have a larger distance. away from the charge, so therefore that costs me less work. But because I did less work, there's less stored energy, which then tells me that my potential energy function here that I stored in the field is small. So again, when I look at this guy, the reason why this guy is small is because when I look at the change in potential energy, This guy was large. That's why I stored very little in the field. Last one, our charge dependence.
So I have the same setup as before. So if I come here and I just, I steal the initial situations here, I do the exact same type of thinking here. My test charges start at infinity. So I need to isolate what's happening with the charge. Then I have my source charge, big Q here. So now if I'm worried about charge here, then I have to have different amount of source charges. Maybe what this guy has, it has a whole bunch of charges. This one has less charge. So now what I'm going to do is that to isolate the charge factor, I'm going to bring the charges exactly to the same location. In other words, the distance between each of these is R. So it's not about the distance, but we can say this, that because this has more charge, that electric field is going to be huge compared to this guy who has a small electric field that's going to be tiny. Again, we ask, which requires more work? This guy is a larger source charge and so therefore it takes more work to bring that charge there and therefore there's more stored work which then means i have a higher electrical potential energy there so if it's higher, then I could then come in and say that potential energy-wise, I'm going to say that I have 4 pi epsilon r. But now I have a big Q. And as a consequence, this then gives me the large potential energy right there. But if I have a smaller source charge, then that's going to be less work and therefore less stored work. And therefore, I have a really small potential energy. So then picture wise, again, we have 4 pi epsilon r. So then I just have a little tiny Q, which then gives me a smaller electrical potential energy.